Great Expectations by Charles Dickens Chapter 31 On our arrival in Denmark, we found the king and queen of that country, elevated in two armchairs on a kitchen table, holding a court. The whole of the Danish nobility were in attendance, consisting of a noble boy in the wash-leather boots of a gigantic ancestor, a venerable peer with a dirty face, who seemed to have risen from the people late in life, and the Danish chivalry, with a comb in its hair, and a pair of white silk legs, and presenting on the whole a feminine appearance. My gifted townsman stood gloomily apart, with folded arms, and I could have wished that his curls and forehead had been more probable. Several curious little circumstances transpired as the action proceeded. The late king of the country not only appeared to have been troubled with a cough at the time of his decease, but to have taken it with him to the tomb, and to have brought it back. The royal phantom also carried a ghostly manuscript round its truncheon, to which it had the appearance of occasionally referring, and that, too, with an air of anxiety, and a tendency to lose the place of reference which were suggestive of a state of mortality. It was this, I conceive, which led to the shades being advised by the gallery to turn over, a recommendation which it took extremely ill. It was likewise to be noted, of this majestic spirit, that whereas it always appeared with an air of having been out a long time, and walked an immense distance, it perceptibly came from a closely contiguous wall. This occasioned its terrors to be received derisively. The Queen of Denmark, a very buxom lady, though no doubt historically brazen, was considered by the public to have too much brass about her, her chin being attached to her diadem by a broad band of that metal, as if she had a gorgeous toothache, her waist being encircled by another, and each of her arms by another, so that she was openly mentioned as the kettle-drum. The noble boy in the ancestral boots was inconsistent, representing himself as it were in one breath, as an able seaman, a strolling actor, a grave-digger, a clergyman, and a person of the utmost importance at a court-fencing match, on the authority of whose practised eye and nice discrimination the finest strokes were judged. This gradually led to a want of toleration for him, and even, on his being detected in holy orders, and declining to perform the funeral service, to the general indignation taking the form of nuts, Lastly, Ophelia was a prey to such slow musical madness, that when in course of time she had taken off her white muslin scarf, folded it up, and buried it, a sulky man who had been long cooling his impatient nose against an iron bar in the front row of the gallery growled, "'Now the baby's put to bed, let's have supper!' which, to say the least of it, was out of keeping. Upon my unfortunate townsman, all these incidents accumulated with playful effect. Whenever that undecided prince had to ask a question, or state a doubt, the public helped him out with it. As, for example, on the question whether "'Twas nobler in the mind to suffer, some broad yes, and some no, and some inclining to both opinions said, "'Toss up for it!' and quite a debating society arose. When he asked, what should such fellows as he do, crawling between earth and heaven, he was encouraged with loud cries of, "'Hear, hear!' When he appeared with his stocking disordered, its disorder expressed, according to usage, by one very neat fold in the top, which I suppose to be always got up with a flat iron, a conversation took place in the gallery respecting the paleness of his leg, and whether it was occasioned by the turn the ghost had given him. On his taking the recorders, very like a little black flute that had just been played in the orchestra, and handed out at the door, he was called upon unanimously for Rule Britannia. When he recommended the player not to saw the air thus, the sulky man said, "'And don't you do it neither. You're a deal worse than him.' And I grieve to add that peals of laughter greeted Mr. Wopsle on every one of these occasions. But his greatest trials were in the churchyard which had the appearance of a primeval forest, with a kind of small ecclesiastical wash-house on one side, and a turnpike gate on the other. Mr. Wopsle, in a comprehensive black cloak, being descried entering at the turnpike, the grave-digger was admonished in a friendly way. 
Look out! Here's the undertaker coming to see how you're getting on with your work. I believe it is well known in a constitutional country that Mr. Wopsle could not possibly have returned the skull, after moralising over it, without dusting his fingers on a white napkin taken from his breast. But even that innocent and indispensable action did not pass without the comment, Waiter! The arrival of the body for interment, in an empty black box with the lid tumbling open, was the signal for a general joy, which was much enhanced by the discovery, among the bearers, of an individual obnoxious to identification. The joy attended Mr. Wopsle through his struggle with Laertes, on the brink of the orchestra and the grave, and slackened no more, until he had tumbled the king off the kitchen-table, and had died by inches from the ankles upward. We had made some pale efforts in the beginning, to applaud Mr. Wopsle, but they were too hopeless to be persisted in. Therefore we had sat, feeling keenly for him, but laughing, nevertheless, from ear to ear. I laughed in spite of myself all the time. The whole thing was so droll. And yet I had a latent impression that there was something decidedly fine in Mr. Wopsle's elocution. Not for old association's sake, I am afraid, but because it was very slow, very dreary, very uphill and downhill, and very unlike any way in which any man, in any natural circumstances of life or death, ever expressed himself about anything. When the tragedy was over, and he had been called for and hooted, I said to Herbert, "'Let us go at once, or perhaps we shall meet him.' We made all the haste we could downstairs, but we were not quick enough either. Standing at the door was a Jewish man, with an unnatural heavy smear of eyebrow, who caught my eyes as we advanced, and said, when we came up with him, "'Mr. Pip and friend?' Identity of Mr. Pip and friend confessed. "'Mr. Walden Garver,' said the man, "'will be glad to have the honour. "'Walden Garver?' I repeated, when Herbert murmured in my ear, "'Probably Wopsle.' "'Oh,' said I, "'yes. Shall we follow you? A few steps, please.' When we were in a side alley, he turned and asked, "'How did you think he looked? I dressed him.' I don't know what he had looked like, except a funeral, with the addition of a large Danish sun or star hanging round his neck by a blue ribbon, that had given him the appearance of being insured in some extraordinary fire office. But I said he had looked very nice. "'When he come to the grave,' said our conductor, "'he showed his cloak beautiful. But, judging from the wing, it looked to me that when he see the ghost in the Queen's apartment, he might have made more of his stockings. I modestly assented, and we all fell through a little dirty swing-door, into a sort of hot packing-case, immediately behind it. Here Mr. Wopsle was divesting himself of his Danish garments, and here there was just room for us to look at him over one another's shoulders, by keeping the packing-case door, or lid, wide open. "'Gentlemen!' said Mr. Wopsle, I am proud to see you. I hope, Mr. Pip, you will excuse my sending round. I had the happiness to know you in former times, and the drama has ever had a claim which has ever been acknowledged on the noble and the affluent. Meanwhile, Mr. Walden Garver, in a frightful perspiration, was trying to get himself out of his princely sables. "'Skin the stockings off, Mr. Walden Garver,' said the owner of that property, "'or you bust em. Bust em, and you bust five and thirty shillings. Shakespeare never was complimented with a finer pair. Keep quiet in your chair now, and leave em to me.' With that he went upon his knees, and began to flay his victim, who, on the first stocking coming off, would certainly have fallen over backward with his chair, but for there being no room to fall anyhow. I had been afraid until then to say a word about the play. But then Mr. Waldengarver looked up at us complacently, and said, "'Gentlemen, how did it seem to you to, to go in front?' Herbert said from behind, at the same time poking me, "'Capitally!' So I said, "'Capitally!' "'How did you like my reading of the character, gentlemen?' said Mr. Waldengarver, 
almost, if not quite, with patronage. Herbert said from behind, again poking me, "'Massive and concrete!' So I said boldly, as if I had originated it, and must beg to insist upon it, "'Massive and concrete! I am glad to have your approbation, gentlemen,' said Mr. Waldengarver, with an air of dignity, in spite of his being ground against the wall at the time, and holding on by the seat of the chair. "'But I'll tell you one thing, Mr. Waldengarver,' said the man who was on his knees, "'in which you're out in your reading. Now mind, I don't care who says contrary. I tell you so. You're out in your reading of Hamlet when you get your legs in profile. The last Hamlet, as I dressed, made the same mistake in his reading at rehearsal, till I got him to put a large red wafer on each of his shins, and then at rehearsal, which was the last, I went in front, sir, to the back of the pit, and whenever his reading brought him into profile, I called out, I don't see no wafers, and at night his reading was lovely. Mr. Waldengarver smiled at me, as much as to say, a faithful dependent, I overlook his folly, and then said aloud, My view is a little classic and thoughtful for them here, but they will improve, they will improve. Herbert and I said together, Oh, no doubt they would improve. Did you observe, gentlemen, said Mr. Waldengarver, that there was a man in the gallery who endeavoured to cast derision on the service, I mean, the representation? We basely replied that we rather thought we had noticed such a man. I added, he was drunk, no doubt. Oh, dear, no, sir, said Mr. Wopsle, not drunk. His employer would see to that, sir. His employer would not allow him to be drunk. "'You know his employer?' said I. Mr. Wopsle shut his eyes, and opened them again, performing both ceremonies very slowly. "'You must have observed, gentlemen,' said he, "'an ignorant and a blatant ass, with a rasping throat, and a countenance expressive of low malignity, who went through, I will not say sustained, the role, if I may use a French expression, of Claudius, King of Denmark. That is his employer, gentlemen. Such is the profession." Without distinctly knowing whether I should have been more sorry for Mr. Wopsle, if he had been in despair, I was so sorry for him as it was, that I took the opportunity of his turning round to have his braces put on, which jostled us out at the doorway, to ask Herbert what he thought of having him home to supper. Herbert said he thought it would be kind to do so. Therefore I invited him, and he went to Barnard's with us, wrapped up to the eyes, and we did our best for him, and he sat until two o'clock in the morning, reviewing his success and developing his plans. I forget in detail what they were, but I have a general recollection that he was to begin with reviving the drama, and to end with crushing it, inasmuch as his decease would leave it utterly bereft, and without a chance or hope. Miserably I went to bed after all, and miserably thought of Estella, and miserably dreamed that my expectations were all cancelled, and that I had to give my hand in marriage to Herbert's Clara, or play Hamlet to Miss Havisham's ghost, before twenty thousand people, without knowing twenty words of it. End of chapter 31"'Chapter 32. "'One day, when I was busy with my books and Mr. Pocket, "'I received a note by the post, "'the mere outside of which threw me into a great flutter. "'For, though I had never seen the handwriting in which it was addressed, "'I divined whose hand it was. "'It had no set beginning as, "'Dear Mr. Pip, or Dear Pip, or Dear Sir, or Dear Anything, "'but ran thus.' I am to come to London the day after to-morrow, by the midday coach. I believe it was settled you should meet me. At all events, Miss Havisham has that impression, and I write in obedience to it. She sends you her regard. Yours, Estella. If there had been time, I should probably have ordered several suits of clothes for this occasion, but there was not, 
I was fain to be content with those I had. My appetite vanished instantly, and I knew no peace or rest until the day arrived. Not that its arrival brought me either, for then I was worse than ever, and began haunting the coach-office in Wood Street, Cheapside, before the coach had left the Blue Boar in our town. For all that I knew this perfectly well, I still felt as if it were not safe to let the coach-office be out of my sight longer than five minutes at a time, and in this condition of unreason I had performed the first half-hour of a watch of four or five hours, when Wemmick ran against me. "'Hello, Mr. Pip,' said he. "'How do you do? I should hardly have thought this was your beat.' I explained that I was waiting to meet somebody who was coming up by coach, and I inquired after the castle and the aged. "'Both flourishing, thank ye,' said Wemmick, "'and particularly the aged. He's in wonderful feather. He'll be eighty-two next birthday. I have a notion of firing eighty-two times, if the neighbourhood shouldn't complain, and that cannon of mine should prove equal to the pressure. However, this is not London talk.' "'Where do you think I'm going to?' "'To the office,' said I, for he was tending in that direction. "'Next thing to it,' returned Wemmick, "'I'm going to Newgate. We are in a banker's parcel case just at present, and I have been down the road, taking a squint at the scene of action, and thereupon must have a word or two with our client.' "'Did your client commit the robbery?' I asked. "'Bless your soul and body, no!' answered Wemmick very dryly. But he is accused of it. So might you or I be. Either of us might be accused of it, you know. Only neither of us is, I remarked. Yeah, said Wemmick, touching me on the breast with his forefinger. You're a deep one, Mr. Pip. Would you like to have a look at Newgate? Have you time to spare? I had so much time to spare that the proposal came as a relief notwithstanding its irreconcilability with my latent desire to keep my eye on the coach-office. Muttering that I would make the inquiry whether I had time to walk with him, I went into the office, and ascertained from the clerk, with the nicest precision and much to the trying of his temper, the earliest moment at which the coach could be expected, which I knew beforehand quite as well as he. I then rejoined Mr. Wemmick, and affecting to consult my watch, and to be surprised by the information I had received, accepted his offer. We were at Newgate in a few minutes, and we passed through the lodge, where some fetters were hanging up on the bare walls, among the prison rules, into the interior of the jail. At that time jails are much neglected, and the period of exaggerated reaction consequent on all public wrongdoing, and which is always its heaviest and longest punishment, was still far off. So felons were not lodged and fed better than soldiers, to say nothing of paupers, and seldom set fire to their prisons, with the excusable object of improving the flavour of their soup. It was visiting time when Wemmick took me in, and a pot-man was going his rounds with beer, and the prisoners, behind bars and yards, were buying beer, and talking to friends, and a frowsy, ugly, disorderly, depressing scene it was. It struck me that Wemmick walked among the prisoners, much as a gardener might walk among his plants. This was first put into my head, by his seeing a shoot that had come up in the night, and saying, "'What, Captain Tom, are you there?' "'Ah, indeed.' "'And also, is that black bill behind the cistern? "'Why, I didn't look for you these two months. "'How do you find yourself?' Equally in his stopping at the bars and attending to anxious whisperers, always singly, Wemmick, with his post-office in an immovable state, looked at them while in conference, as if he were taking particular notice of the advance they had made, since last observed, towards coming out in full blow at their trial. He was highly popular, and I found that he took the familiar department of Mr. Jaggers's business, though something of the state of Mr. Jaggers hung about him too, forbidding approach beyond certain limits. His personal recognition of each successive client was comprised in a nod, and in his settling his hat a little easier on his head with both hands and then tightening the post-office, and putting his hands in his pockets. In one or two instances there was a difficulty respecting the raising of fees, and then Mr. Wemmick, backing as far as possible from the insufficient money produced, said, "'It's no use, my boy. 
I'm only a subordinate. I can't take it. Don't go on in that way with a subordinate. If you are unable to make up your quantum, my boy, you had better address yourself to a principal. There are plenty of principals in the profession, you know, and what is not worth the while of one may be the worth while of another. That's my recommendation to you, speaking as a subordinate. Don't try on useless measures. Why should you? Now, who's next? Thus we walked through Wemmick's greenhouse, until he turned to me and said, Notice the man I shall shake hands with. I should have done so, without the preparation, as he had shaken hands with no one yet. Almost as soon as he had spoken, a portly upright man, whom I can see now as I write, in a well-worn olive-coloured frock-coat, with a peculiar pallor overspreading the red in his complexion, and eyes that went wandering about when he tried to fix them, came up to a corner of the bars, and put his hand to his hat, which had a greasy and fatty surface, like cold broth, with a half-serious and half-jocose military salute. "'Colonel, to you,' said Wemmick. "'How are you, Colonel?' "'All right, Mr. Wemmick.' "'Everything was done that could be done, but the evidence was too strong for us, Colonel.' "'Yes, it was too strong, sir, but I don't care.' "'No, no,' said Wemmick coolly. "'You don't care.' Then turning to me, "'Served His Majesty this man, was a soldier in the line, and bought his discharge.' I said, "'Indeed?' And the man's eyes looked at me, and then looked over my head, and then looked all around me, and then he drew his hand across his lips, and laughed. "'I think I shall be out of this on Monday, sir,' he said to Wemmick. "'Perhaps,' returned my friend, "'but there's no knowing. "'I am glad to have the chance of bidding you good-bye, Mr. Wemmick,' said the man, stretching out his hand between two bars. "'Thank ye,' said Wemmick, shaking hands with him. "'Same to you, Colonel. "'If what I had upon me, when taken, had been real, Mr. Wemmick,' said the man, unwilling to let his hand go, "'I should have asked the favour of your wearing another ring, in acknowledgment of your attentions.' "'I'll accept the will for the deed,' said Wemmick. "'By the by, you were quite a pigeon-fancier.' The man looked up at the sky. "'I'm told you had a remarkable breed of tumblers. Could you commission any friend of yours to bring me a pair, uh, if you've no further use for them?' "'It shall be done, sir.' "'All right,' said Wemmick. "'I shall be taken care of. Good afternoon, Colonel. Good bye they shook hands again, and as we walked away, Wemmick said to me, "'A coiner, a very good workman. The recorder's report is made to-day, and he's sure to be executed on Monday. Still, you see, as far as it goes, a pair of pigeons are portable property all the same.' With that, he looked back, and nodded at this dead plant, and then cast his eyes about him in walking out of the yard, as if he were considering what other pot would go best in its place. As we came out of the prison through the lodge, I found that the great importance of my guardian was appreciated by the turnkeys, no less than by those whom they held in charge. "'Well, Mr. Wemmick,' said the turnkey, who kept us between the two studded and spiked lodge gates, and who carefully locked one before he unlocked the other, "'What's Mr. Jaggers going to do with that water-side murder? Is he going to make it manslaughter? Or what's he going to make of it?' "'Why don't you ask him?' returned Wemmick. "'Oh, yes, I dare say,' said the turnkey. "'Now, that's the way with them here, Mr. Pip,' remarked Wemmick, turning to me with his post-office elongated. "'They don't mind what they ask of me, the subordinate, but you'll never catch em asking any questions of my principal.' "'Is this young gentlemen, one of the prentices, or articled ones, of your office?" asked the turnkey, with a grin at Mr. Wemmick's humour. "'There he goes again, you see,' cried Wemmick. "'I told you so. Asked another question of the subordinate, before his first is dry. Well, supposing Mr. Pip is one of them?' "'Why, then,' said the turnkey, grinning again, "'he knows what Mr. Jaggers is?" "'Yah!' 
cried Mr. Wemmick, suddenly hitting out of the turnkey in a facetious way. "'You're dumb as one of your own keys, and you have to do with my principal. You know you are. Let us out, you old fox, or I'll get him to bring an action against you for false imprisonment.' The turnkey laughed, and gave us a good day, and stood laughing at us over the spikes of the wicket when we descended the steps into the street. "'Mind you, Mr. Pip,' said Wemmick gravely in my ear, as he took my arm to be more confidential. "'I don't know that Mr. Jaggers does a better thing than the way in which he keeps himself so high. He's always so high. His constant height is of a piece with his immense abilities. That Colonel durst no more take leave of him, and that turnkey durst ask him his intentions respecting a case. Then, between his height and them, he slips in his subordinate. Don't you see? And so he has him soul and body." I was very much impressed, and not for the first time, by my guardian's subtlety. To confess the truth, I very heartily wished, and not for the first time, that I had had some other guardian of minor abilities. Mr. Wemmick and I parted at the office in Little Britain, where suppliants for Mr. Jaggers's notice were lingering about as usual, and I returned to my watch in the street of the coach-office with some three hours on hand. I consumed the whole time in thinking how strange it was that I should be encompassed by all this taint of prison and crime, that in my childhood, out in our lonely marshes on a winter evening, I should have first encountered it, that it should have reappeared on two occasions, starting out like a stain that was faded but not gone, that it should in this new way pervade my fortune and advancement. While my mind was thus engaged, I thought of the beautiful young Estella, proud and refined, coming towards me, and I thought with absolute abhorrence of the contrast between the jail and her. I wished that Wemmick had not met me, or that I had not yielded to him and gone with him, so that, of all days in the year, on this day, I might not have had Newgate in my breath and on my clothes. I beat the prison dust off my feet as I sauntered to and fro and I shook it out of my dress, and I exhaled its air from my lungs. So contaminated did I feel, remembering who was coming, that the coach came quickly after all, and I was not yet free from the soiling consciousness of Mr. Wemmick's conservatory, when I saw her face at the coach-window, and her hand waving to me. What was the nameless shadow, which again, in that one instant, had passed? End of chapter 32 Chapter 33 In her furred travelling dress, Estella seemed more delicately beautiful than she had ever seemed yet, even in my eyes. Her manner was more winning than she had cared to let it be to me before, and I thought I saw Miss Havisham's influence in the change. We stood in the inn-yard while she pointed out her luggage to me, and when it was all collected, I remembered, having forgotten everything but herself in the meanwhile, that I knew nothing of her destination. "'I am going to Richmond,' she told me. "'Our lesson is that there are two Richmonds, one in Surrey and one in Yorkshire, and that mine is the Surrey Richmond. The distance is ten miles. I am to have a carriage, and you are to take me. This is my purse, and you are to pay my charges out of it. Oh, you must take the purse. We have no choice, you and I, but to obey our instructions.' We are not free to follow our own devices, you and I." As she looked at me, in giving me the purse, I hoped there was an inner meaning in her words. She said them slightingly, but not with displeasure. "'A carriage will have to be sent for, Estella. Will you rest here a little?' "'Yes, I am to rest here a little, and I am to drink some tea, and you are to take care of me the while.' She drew her arm through mine, as if it must be done and I requested a waiter, who had been staring at the coach, like a man who had never seen such a thing in his life, to show us a private sitting-room. Upon that, he pulled out a napkin, as if it were a magic clue, without which he couldn't find the way upstairs, and led us to the black hole of the establishment, fitted up with a diminishing mirror, quite a superfluous article, considering the hole's proportions, an anchovy sauce cruet, and somebody's patterns, 
on my objecting to this retreat, he took us into another room, with a dinner-table for thirty, and in the grate a scorched leaf of a copy-book under a bushel of coal-dust. Having looked at this extinct conflagration, and shaken his head, he took my order, which, proving to be merely, "'Some tea for the lady,' sent him out of the room in a very low state of mind. I was, and I am, sensible that the air of this chamber, in its strong combination of stable with soup-stock, might have led one to infer that the coaching department was not doing well, and that the enterprising proprietor was boiling down the horses for the refreshment department. Yet the room was all in all to me, Estella being in it. I thought that with her I could have been happy there for life. I was not at all happy there at the time, observe, and I knew it well. "'Where are you going to, uh, to Richmond?' I asked Estella. "'I am going to live.' said she, at a great expense, with a lady there, who has the power, or says she has, of taking me about, and introducing me, and showing people to me, and showing me to people. "'I suppose you will be glad of variety and admiration?' "'Yes, I suppose so.' She answered so carelessly that I said, "'You speak of yourself as if you were someone else.' "'Where did you learn how I speak of others? Come, come.' said Estella, smiling delightfully. "'You must not expect me to go to school to you. I must talk in my own way. How do you thrive with Mr. Pocket?' "'I live quite pleasantly there. At least—' It appeared to me that I was losing a chance. "'At least?' repeated Estella. "'As pleasantly as I could anywhere, away from you.' "'You silly boy,' said Estella, quite composedly. "'How can you talk such nonsense?' "'Your friend Mr. Matthew, I believe, is superior to the rest of his family?' "'Very superior, indeed. He is nobody's enemy.' "'Don't add but his own,' interposed Estella, "'for I hate that class of man. But he really is disinterested, and above small jealousy and spite, I have heard.' "'I am sure I have every reason to say so.' "'You have not every reason to say so of the rest of his people,' said Estella nodding at me with an expression of face that was at once grave and rallying, for they beset Miss Havisham with reports and insinuations to your disadvantage. They watch you, misrepresent you, write letters about you, anonymous sometimes, and you are the torment and the occupation of their lives. You can scarcely realise to yourself the hatred those people feel for you. They do me no harm, I hope. Instead of answering— Estella burst out laughing. This was very singular to me, and I looked at her in considerable perplexity. When she left off, and she had not laughed languidly, but with real enjoyment, I said in my diffident way with her, "'I hope I may suppose that you would not be amused if they did me any harm.' "'No, no, you may be sure of that,' said Estella. "'You may be certain that I laugh because they fail.' "'Oh, those people with Miss Havisham, and the tortures they undergo!' She laughed again, and even now, when she had told me why, her laughter was very singular to me, for I could not doubt its being genuine, and yet it seemed too much for the occasion. I thought there must really be something more here than I knew. She saw the thought in my mind, and answered it. "'It is not easy for even you,' said Estella to know what satisfaction it gives me, to see those people thwarted, or what an enjoyable sense of the ridiculous I have, when they are made ridiculous. For you were not brought up in that strange house from a mere baby. I was. You had not your little wits sharpened by their intriguing against you, suppressed and defenceless, under the mask of sympathy and pity and what not, that is soft and soothing. I had. You did not gradually open your round childish eyes wider and wider to the discovery of that impostor of a woman who calculates her stores of peace of mind for when she wakes up in the night. I did. It was no laughing matter with Estella now, nor was she summoning these remembrances from any shallow place. I would not have been the cause of that look of hers for all my expectations in a heap. Two things I can tell you 
said Estella. First, notwithstanding the proverb that constant dripping will wear away a stone, you may set your mind at rest that these people never will, never would, in a hundred years, impair your ground with Miss Havisham in any particular, great or small. Second, I am beholden to you as the cause of their being so busy and so mean and vain, and there is my hand upon it. And she gave it me playfully, for her darker mood had been but momentary. I held it, and put it to my lips. "'You ridiculous boy,' said Estella. "'Will you never take warning? Or do you kiss my hand on the same spirit in which I once let you kiss my cheek?' "'What spirit was that?' said I. "'I must think a moment. A spirit of contempt for the fawners and plotters.' "'If I say yes, may I kiss the cheek again?' "'You should have asked before you touched the hand. But, yes, if you like.' I leaned down, and her calm face was like a statue's. "'Now,' said Estella, gliding away the instant I touched her cheek, "'you are to take care that I have some tea, and you are to take me to Richmond.' Her reverting to this tone, as if our association were forced upon us, and we were mere puppets, gave me pain, but everything in our intercourse did give me pain. Whatever her tone with me happened to be, I could put no trust in it, and build no hope on it. And yet I went on against trust and against hope. Why I repeated a thousand times? So it always was. I rang for the tea, and the waiter, reappearing with his magic clue, brought in by degrees some fifty adjuncts to that refreshment, but of tea, not a glimpse. A tea-board, cups and saucers, plates, knives and forks, including carvers, spoons, various, salt-cellars, a meek little muffin confined with the utmost precaution under a strong iron cover, Moses in the bulrushes, typified by a soft bit of butter in a quantity of parsley, a pale loaf with a powdered head, two proof impressions of the bars of the kitchen fireplace on triangular bits of bread, and ultimately a fat family urn, which the waiter staggered in with, expressing in his countenance burden and suffering. After a prolonged absence at this stage of the entertainment, he at length came back with a casket of precious appearance, containing twigs. These I steeped in hot water, and so from the whole of these appliances extracted one cup of I don't know what for Estella. The bill paid, and the waiter remembered, and the ostler not forgotten, and the chambermaid taken into consideration. In a word, the whole house bribed into a state of contempt and animosity, and Estella's purse much lightened. We got into our post-coach and drove away. Turning into Cheapside, and rattling up Newgate Street, we were soon under the walls of which I was so ashamed. "'What place is that?' Estella asked me. I made a foolish pretence of not at first recognising it, and then told her. As she looked at it, and drew in her head again, murmuring, "'Wretches! I would not have confessed to my visit for any consideration.' "'Mr. Jaggers,' said I, by way of putting it neatly on somebody else, "'has the reputation of being more in the secrets of that dismal place than any man in London.' "'He is more in the secrets of every place, I think.' said Estella, in a low voice. "'You have been accustomed to see him often, I suppose?' "'I have been accustomed to see him at uncertain intervals, ever since I can remember. But I know him no better now than I did before I could speak plainly. What is your own experience of him? Do you advance with him?' "'Once habituated to his distrustful manner,' said I, "'I have done very well.' "'Are you intimate?' I have dined with him at his private house. I fancy, said Estella, shrinking, that must be a curious place. It is a curious place. I should have been chary of discussing my guardian too freely, even with her, but I should have gone on with the subject so far as to describe the dinner in Gerard Street, if we had not then come into a sudden glare of gas. It seemed, while it lasted, to be all alight and alive, with that inexplicable feeling that I had had before. And when we were out of it, I was as much dazed for a few moments, as if I had been enlightening. So we fell into other talk, 
and it was principally about the way by which we were travelling, and about what parts of London lay on this side of it, and what on that. The great city was almost new to her, she told me, for she had never left Miss Havisham's neighbourhood, until she had gone to France, and she had merely passed through London then, in going and returning. I asked her if my guardian had any charge of her while she remained here. To that she emphatically said, "'God forbid!' and no more. It was impossible for me to avoid seeing that she cared to attract me, that she made herself winning, and would have won me even if the task had needed pains. Yet this made me none the happier, for, even if she had not taken that tone of our being disposed of by others, I should have felt that she held my heart in her hand, because she wilfully chose to do it, and not because it would have wrung any tenderness in her to crush it and throw it away. When we passed through Hammersmith, I showed her where Mr. Matthew Pocket lived, and said it was no great way from Richmond, and that I hoped I should see her sometimes. "'Oh, yes! You are to see me. You are to come when you think proper. You are to be mentioned to the family. Indeed, you are already mentioned.' I inquired, was it a large household she was going to be a member of? "'No. There are only two. Mother and daughter. The mother is a lady of some station though not averse to increasing her income. "'I wonder Miss Havisham could part with you again so soon.' "'It is a part of Miss Havisham's plans for me, Pip,' said Estella, with a sigh, as if she were tired. "'I am to write to her constantly, and see her regularly, and report how I go on, I and the jewels, for they are nearly all mine now.' It was the first time she had ever called me by my name. Of course she did so purposely, and knew that I should treasure it up. We came to Richmond all too soon, and our destination there was a house by the green, a staid old house, where hoops and powder and patches, embroidered coats, rolled stockings, ruffles and swords, had had their court days many a time. Some ancient trees before the house were still cut into fashions as formal and unnatural as the hoops and wigs and stiff skirts but their own allotted places, in the great possession of the dead, were not far off, and they would soon drop into them, and go the silent way of the rest. A bell with an old voice, which I dare say in its time had often said to the house, Here is the green farthingale, here is the diamond-hilted sword, here are the shoes with the red heels and the blue solitaire, sounded gravely in the moonlight, and two cherry-coloured maids came fluttering out to receive Estella. The doorway soon absorbed her boxes, and she gave me her hand and a smile, and said good-night, and was absorbed likewise. And still I stood looking at the house, thinking how happy I should be if I lived there with her, and knowing that I never was happy with her, but always miserable. I got into the carriage to be taken back to Hammersmith, and I got in with a bad heartache, and I got out with a worse heartache. At our own door, I found little Jane Pocket coming home from a little party, escorted by her little lover, and I envied her little lover, in spite of his being subject to Flopson. Mr. Pocket was out lecturing, for he was a most delightful lecturer on domestic economy, and his treatise on the management of children and servants were considered the very best textbooks on those themes. But Mrs. Pocket was at home, and was in a little difficulty on account of the baby's having been accommodated with a needle-case to keep him quiet during the unaccountable absence, with a relative in the foot-guards, of Miller's. And more needles were missing than it could be regarded as quite wholesome for a patient of such tender years, either to apply externally or to take as a tonic. Mr. Pocket, being justly celebrated for giving most excellent practical advice, and for having a clear and sound perception of things in a highly judicious mind, I had some notion in my heartache of begging him to accept my confidence. But, happening to look up at Mrs. Pocket, as she sat reading her book of dignities, at a prescribing bed as a sovereign remedy for baby, I thought, well, no, I wouldn't. End of chapter 33、Chapter、34 As I had grown accustomed to my expectations, 
I had insensibly begun to notice their effect upon myself and those around me. Their influence on my own character I disguised from my recognition as much as possible, but I knew very well that it was not all good. I lived in a state of chronic uneasiness respecting my behaviour to Joe. My conscience was not by any means comfortable about Biddy. When I woke up in the night, like Camilla, I used to think, with a weariness on my spirits, that I should have been happier and better if I had never seen Miss Havisham's face, and had risen to manhood, content to be partners with Joe in the honest old forge. Many a time of an evening when I sat alone looking at the fire, I thought, after all, there was no fire like the forge fire, and the kitchen fire at home. Yet Estella was so inseparable from all my restlessness and disquiet of mind, that I really fell into confusion as to the limits of my own part in its production. That is to say, supposing I had had no expectations, and yet had had Estella to think of, I could not make out to my satisfaction that I should have done much better. Now, concerning the influence of my position on others, I was in no such difficulty, and so I perceived, though dimly enough perhaps, that it was not beneficial to anybody, and above all, that it was not beneficial to Herbert. My lavish habits led his easy nature into expenses that he could not afford, corrupted the simplicity of his life, and disturbed his peace with anxieties and regrets. I was not at all remorseful for having unwittingly set those other branches of the Pocket family to the poor arts they practised, because such littleness were their natural bent, and would have been evoked by anybody else if I had left them slumbering. But Herbert's was a very different case, and it often caused me a twinge to think that I had done him evil service in crowding his sparsely furnished chambers with incongruous upholstery work, and placing the canary-breasted avenger at his disposal. So now, as an infallible way of making little ease great ease, I began to contract a quantity of debt. I could hardly begin, but Herbert must begin too, so he soon followed. At Startop's suggestion, we put ourselves down for election into a club called the Finches of the Grove, the object of which institution I have never divined. If it were not that the members should dine expensively once a fortnight, to quarrel among themselves as much as possible after dinner, and to cause six waiters to get drunk on the stairs. I know that these gratifying social ends were so invariably accomplished, that Herbert and I understood nothing else to be referred to, and the first standing toast of the society, which ran, "'Gentlemen, may the present promotion of good feeling ever reign predominant among the finches of the grove.' The finches spent their money foolishly. The hotel we dined at was in Covent Garden, and the first finch I saw, when I had the honour of joining the grove, was Bentley Drummle, at that time floundering about town in a cab of his own, and doing a great deal of damage to the posts at the street corners. Occasionally he shot himself out of his equipage head foremost over the apron, and I saw him on one occasion deliver himself at the door of the grove in this unintentional way, like coals. But here I anticipate a little, for I was not a finch, and could not be, according to the sacred laws of the society, until I came of age. In my confidence in my own resources, I would willingly have taken Herbert's expenses on myself. But Herbert was proud, and I could make no such proposal to him. So he got into difficulties in every direction, and continued to look about him. When we gradually fell into keeping late hours and late company, I noticed that he looked about him with a desponding eye at breakfast-time, that he began to look about him more hopefully about midday, that he drooped when he came into dinner, that he seemed to descry capital in the distance rather clearly, after dinner, that he all but realised capital towards midnight, and that at about two o'clock in the morning he became so deeply despondent again as to talk of buying a rifle and going to America, with the general purpose of compelling buffaloes to make his fortune. I was usually at Hammersmith about half the week, and when I was at Hammersmith I haunted Richmond, whereof separately, by and by, Herbert would often come to Hammersmith when I was there, and I think, at those seasons, his father would occasionally have some passing perception 
that the opening he was looking for had not appeared yet. But in the general tumbling up of the family, his tumbling out in life somewhere was a thing to transact itself somehow. In the meantime Mr. Pocket grew greyer, and tried oftener to lift himself out of his perplexities by the hair, while Mrs. Pocket tripped up the family with her footstool, read her book of dignities, lost her pocket-handkerchief, told us about her grandpapa, and taught the young idea how to shoot, by shooting it into bed whenever it attracted her notice. As I am now generalising a period of my life, with the object of clearing my way before me, I can scarcely do so better than by at once completing the description of our usual manners and customs at Barnard's Inn. We spent as much money as we could, and got as little for it as people could make up their minds to give us. We were always more or less miserable, and most of our acquaintance were in the same condition. There was a gay fiction among us that we were constantly enjoying ourselves, and a skeleton truth that we never did. To the best of my belief, our case was in the last aspect a rather common one. Every morning, with an air ever new, Herbert went into the city to look about him. I often paid him a visit in the dark back room, in which he consorted with an ink-jar, a hat-peg, a coal-box, a string-box, an almanac, a desk, and stool, and a ruler, and I do not remember that I ever saw him do anything else but look about him. If we all did what we undertake to do, as faithfully as Herbert did, we might live in a republic of the virtues. He had nothing else to do, poor fellow, except, at a certain hour of every afternoon, to go to Lloyd's, in observance of a ceremony of seeing his principal, I think. He never did anything else in connection with Lloyd's that I could find out, except come back again. When he felt his case unusually serious, and that he positively must find an opening, he would go on change at a busy time, and walk in and out in a kind of gloomy country-dance figure among the assembled magnates. "'For,' says Herbert to me, coming home to dinner on one of those special occasions, "'I find the truth to be, Handel, that an opening won't come to one, but one must go to it. So I have been.' If we had been less attached to one another, I think we must have hated one another regularly every morning. I detested the chambers beyond expression at that period of repentance, and could not endure the sight of the Avenger's livery, which had a more expensive and a less remunerative appearance then than at any other time in the four-and-twenty hours. As we got more and more into debt, breakfast became a hollower and hollower form and, being on one occasion at breakfast-time, threatened, by letter, with legal proceedings, not unholy unconnected, as my local paper might put it, with jewellery, I went so far as to seize the avenger by his blue collar, and shake him off his feet, so that he was actually in the air, like a booted cupid, for presuming to suppose that we wanted a roll. At certain times, meaning at uncertain times, for they depended on our humour, I would say to Herbert, as if it were a remarkable discovery, "'My dear Herbert, we are getting on badly. My dear Handel,' Herbert would say to me in all sincerity, "'if you will believe me, those very words are on my lips, by a strange coincidence.' "'Then, Herbert,' I would respond, "'let us look into our affairs.' We always derived profound satisfaction from making an appointment for this purpose. I always thought this was business. This was the way to confront the thing, this was the way to take the foe by the throat, and I know Herbert thought so too. We ordered something rather special for dinner, with a bottle of something similarly out of the common way, in order that our minds might be fortified for the occasion, and we might come well up to the mark. Dinner over, we produced a bundle of pens, a copious supply of ink, and a goodly show of writing and blotting paper, for there was something very comfortable in having plenty of stationery. I would then take a sheet of paper, and write across the top of it, in a neat hand, the heading, Memorandum of Pip's Debts, with Barnard's Inn, and the date very carefully added. Herbert would also take a sheet of paper, and write across it with similar formalities, Memorandum of Herbert's Debts. Each of us would then refer to a confused heap of papers at his side, which had been thrown into drawers, worn into holes in pockets, half-burnt in lighting candles, 
stuck for weeks into the looking-glass, and otherwise damaged. The sound of our pens going refreshed us exceedingly, insomuch that I sometimes found it difficult to distinguish between this edifying business proceeding and actually paying the money. In point of meritorious character, the two things seemed about equal. When we had written a little while, I would ask Herbert how he got on. Herbert probably would have been scratching his head in a most rueful manner at the sight of his accumulating figures. "'They are mounting up, Handel,' Herbert would say. "'Upon my life, they are mounting up.' "'Be firm, Herbert,' I would retort, plying my own pen with great assiduity. "'Look the thing in the face. Look into your affairs. Stare them out of countenance.' "'So I would, Handel. Only they are staring me out of countenance.' However. My determined manner would have its effect, and Herbert would fall to work again. After time he would give up once more, on the plea that he had not yet got Cobbs's bill, or Lobbs's, or Nobbs's, as the case might be. "'Then, Herbert, estimate. Estimate in round numbers, and put it down.' "'What a fellow of resource you are!' my friend would reply with admiration. "'Really, your business powers are very remarkable.' "'I thought so, too.' I established with myself, on these occasions, the reputation of a first-rate man of business, prompt, decisive, energetic, clear, cool-headed. When I had got all my responsibilities down upon my list, I compared each with the bill, and ticked it off. My self-approval, when I ticked an entry, was quite a luxurious sensation. When I had no more ticks to make, I folded all my bills up uniformly, docketed each on the back and tied the whole into a symmetrical bundle. Then I did the same for Herbert, who modestly said he had not my administrative genius, and felt that I had brought his affairs into a focus for him. My business habits had one other bright feature, which I called leaving a margin. For example, supposing Herbert's debts to be one hundred and sixty-four pounds four and tuppence, I would say, leave a margin and put them down at two hundred. Or, supposing my own to be four times as much, I would leave a margin and put them down at seven hundred. I had the highest opinion of the wisdom of this same margin, but I am bound to acknowledge that on looking back I deem it to have been an expensive device. For we always ran into new debt immediately, to the full extent of the margin, and sometimes, in the sense of freedom and solvency it imparted, got pretty far on into another margin. But there was a calm, a rest, a virtuous hush, consequent on these examinations of our affairs, that gave me, for the time, an admirable opinion of myself. Soothed by my exertions, my method, and Herbert's compliments, I would sit with his symmetrical bundle, and my own on the table before me among the stationery, and feel like a bank of some sort, rather than a private individual. We shut our outer door on these solemn occasions, in order that we might not be interrupted. I had fallen into my serene state one evening, when we heard a letter drop through the slit in the said door, and fall on the ground. "'It's for you, Handel,' said Herbert, going out and coming back with it, "'and I hope there is nothing the matter.' This was in allusion to its heavy black seal and border. The letter was signed, Trab and Co., and its contents were simply, that I was an honoured sir, and that they begged to inform me that Mrs. J. Gargery had departed this life on Monday last, at twenty minutes past six in the evening, and that my attendance was requested at the interment on Monday next, at three o'clock in the afternoon. End of chapter 34 CHAPTER Thirty Five. It was the first time that a grave had opened in my road of life, and the gap it made in the smooth ground was wonderful. The figure of my sister in her chair by the kitchen fire haunted me night and day. That the place could possibly be without her was something my mind seemed unable to compass, and whereas she had seldom or never been in my thoughts of late, I had now the strangest ideas that she was coming towards me in the street, or that she would presently knock at the door. In my rooms, too, with which she had never been at all associated, there was at once the blankness of death, 
and a perpetual suggestion of the sound of her voice, or the turn of her face or figure, as if she were still alive and had been often there. Whatever my fortunes might have been, I could scarcely have recalled my sister with much tenderness, but I suppose there is a shock of regret which may exist without much tenderness. Under its influence, and perhaps to make up for the want of the softer feeling, I was seized with a violent indignation against the assailant from whom she had suffered so much, and I felt that on sufficient proof I could have revengefully pursued Orlick, or any one else, to the last extremity. Having written to Joe to offer consolation, and to assure him that I should come to the funeral, I passed the intermediate days in the curious state of mind I have glanced at. I went down early in the morning, and alighted at the blue ball, in good time to walk over to the forge. It was fine summer weather again, and as I walked along, the times when I was a little helpless creature, and my sitter did not spare me, vividly returned. But they returned with the gentle tone upon them, that softened even the edge of Tickler. For now, the very breath of the beans and clover whispered to my heart that the day must come when it would be well for my memory that others walking in the sunshine should be softened as they thought of me. At last I came within sight of the house, and saw that Trab and Co. had put in a funeral execution and taken possession. Two dismally absurd persons, each ostentatiously exhibiting a crutch done up in a black bandage, as if that instrument could possibly communicate any comfort to anybody, were posted at the front door, and in one of them I recognised the post-boy, discharged from the boar, for turning a young couple into a saw-pit on their bridal morning, in consequence of intoxication, rendering it necessary for him to ride his horse clasped round the neck with both arms. All the children of the village, and most of the women, were admiring these sable warders, and the closed windows of the house and forge. And as I came up, one of the two warders, the postboy, knocked at the door, implying that I was far too much exhausted by grief to have strength remaining to knock for myself. Another sable warder, a carpenter who had once eaten two geese for a wager, opened the door, and showed me into the best parlour. Here Mr. Trabb had taken unto himself the best table, and had got all the leaves up, and was holding a kind of black bazaar, with the aid of a quantity of black pins. At the moment of my arrival, he had just finished putting somebody's hat into black long clothes, like an African baby, so he held out his hand for mine. But I, misled by the action, and confused by the occasion, shook hands with him, with every testimony of warm affection. Poor dear Joe! entangled in a little black cloak, tied in a large bow under his chin, was seated apart at the upper end of the room, where, as chief mourner, he had evidently been stationed by Trab. When I bent down and said to him, "'Dear Joe, how are you?' he said, "'Peep, old chap, you knowed her when she were a fine figure of her,' and clasped my hand, and said no more. Biddy, looking very neat and modest in her black dress, went quietly here and there, and was very helpful. When I had spoken to Biddy, as I thought it not a time for talking, I went and sat down near Joe, and they began to wonder in what part of the house it—she, my sister, was. The air of the parlour being faint with the smell of sweet cake, I looked about for the table of refreshments. It was scarcely visible until one had got accustomed to the gloom. But there was a cut-up plum-cake upon it, and there were cut-up oranges and sandwiches and biscuits, and two decanters that I knew very well as ornaments, but had never seen used in all my life, one full of port and one of sherry. Standing at this table, I became conscious of the servile Pumblechook in a black cloak and several yards of hat-band, who was alternately stuffing himself and making obsequious movements to catch my attention. The moment he succeeded, he came over to me, breathing sherry and crumbs, and said in a subdued voice, "'May I, dear sir?' and did. I then described Mr. and Mrs. Hubble, the last named, in a decent speechless paroxysm in a corner. We were all going to follow, and were all in course of being tied up separately by Trab into ridiculous bundles. 
which I mean to say, Pip, Joe whispered to me, as we were being what Mr. Trabb called formed in the parlour, two and two, and it was dreadfully like a preparation for some grim kind of dance, which I mean to say, sir, as I would in preference have carried her to the church myself, along with three or four friendly ones what come to it with willing hearts and arms, but it were considered what the neighbours would look down on such, and would be of opinions as it were wanting in respect. "'Hockey handkerchiefs out all!' cried Mr. Trabb at this point, in a depressed business-like voice. "'Pocket handkerchiefs out! We are ready!' So we all put our pocket-handkerchiefs to our faces, as if our noses were bleeding, and filed out two and two, Joe and I, Biddy and Pumblechook, Mr. and Mrs. Hubble. The remains of my poor sister had been brought round by the kitchen door, and, it being a point of undertaking ceremony, that the six bearers must be stifled and blinded under a horrible black velvet housing with a white border. The whole looked like a blind monster with twelve human legs, shuffling and blundering along under the guidance of two keepers, the postboy and his comrade. The neighbourhood, however, highly approved of these arrangements, and we were much admired as we went through the village, the more youthful and vigorous part of the community making dashes now and then to cut us off, and lying in wait to intercept us at points of vantage. At such times, the more exuberant among them called out in an excited manner on our emergence round some corner of expectancy. "'Here they come! Here they are!' And we were all but cheered. In this progress I was much annoyed by the abject Pumblechook, who, being behind me, persisted all the way as a delicate attention in arranging my streaming hat-band and smoothing my cloak. My thoughts were further distracted by the excessive pride of Mr. and Mrs. Hubble, who were surpassingly conceited and vainglorious in being members of so distinguished a procession. And now the range of marshes lay clear before us, with the sails of the ships on the river growing out of it and we went into the churchyard, close to the graves of my unknown parents, Philip Pirrup, late of this parish, and also Georgiana, wife of the above. And there my sister was laid quietly in the earth, while the locks sang high above it, and the light wind strewed it with beautiful shadows of clouds and trees. Of the conduct of the worldly-minded Pumblechook, while this was doing, I desire to say no more than it was all addressed to me, and that even when those noble passages were read, which remind humanity how it brought nothing into the world, and can take nothing out, and how it fleeth like a shadow, and never continueth long in one stay, I heard him cough a reservation of the case of a young gentleman who came unexpectedly into large property. When we got back, he had the hardihood to tell me that he wished my sister could have known I had done her so much honour, and to hint that she would have considered it reasonably purchased at the price of her death. After that, he drank all the rest of the sherry, and Mr. Hubble drank the port, and the two talked, which I have since observed to be customary in such cases, as if they were of quite another race from the deceased, and were notoriously immortal. Finally, he went away with Mr. and Mrs. Hubble, to make an evening of it, I felt sure, and to tell the jolly bargemen that he was the founder of my fortunes, and my earliest benefactor. When they were all gone, and when Trabb and his men, but not his boy, I looked for him, had crammed their mummery into bags, and were gone too. The house felt wholesomer. Soon afterwards, Biddy, Joe, and I had a cold dinner together. But we dined in the best parlour, not in the old kitchen and Joe was so exceedingly particular what he did with his knife and fork, and the salt-cellar, and what not, that there was great restraint upon us. But after dinner, when I made him take his pipe, and when I had loitered with him about the forge, and when we sat down together on the great block of stone outside it, we got on better. I noticed that after the funeral, Joe changed his clothes so far as to make a compromise between his Sunday dress and working dress, in which the dear fellow looked natural and like the man he was. He was very much pleased by my asking if I might sleep in my own little room, and I was pleased too. For, 
I felt that I had done rather a great thing in making the request. When the shadows of evening were closing in, I took an opportunity of getting into the garden with Biddy for a little talk. Biddy, said I, I think you might have written to me about these sad matters. Do you, Mr. Pip? said Biddy. I should have written if I had thought that. Don't suppose that I mean to be unkind, Biddy, when I say I consider that you ought to have thought that. Do you, Mr. Pip? She was so quiet, and had such an orderly, good, and pretty way with her, that I did not like the thought of making her cry again. After looking a little at her downcast eyes as she walked beside me, I gave up that point. I suppose it will be difficult for you to remain here now, Biddy, dear. Oh, I can't do so, Mr. Pip, said Biddy, in a tone of regret, but still of quiet conviction. I have been speaking to Mrs. Hubble, and I am going to her to-morrow. I hope we shall be able to take some care of Mr. Gargery together until he settles down. How are you going to live, Biddy? If you want any mu— How am I going to live? repeated Biddy, striking in with a momentary flush upon her face. I'll tell you, Mr. Pip. I am going to try to get the place of mistress in the new school nearly finished here. I can be well recommended by all the neighbours and I hope I can be industrious and patient, and teach myself while I teach others. You know, Mr. Pip, pursued Biddy, with a smile as she raised her eyes to my face, the new schools are not like the old, but I learnt a good deal from you after that time, and I've had time since then to improve. I think you would always improve, Biddy, under any circumstances. Ah, except in my bad side of human nature, murmured Biddy. It was not so much a reproach as an irresistible thinking aloud. Well, I thought, I would give up that point, too. So I walked a little further with Biddy, looking silently at her downcast eyes. I have not heard the particulars of my sister's death, Biddy. They are very slight, poor thing. She had been in one of her bad states, though they had got better of late, rather than worse. For four days, when she came out of it in the evening, just at tea-time, and said quite plainly, "'Joe!' As she had never said any word for a long while, I ran and fetched in Mr. Gargery from the forge. She made signs to me that she wanted him to sit down close to her, and wanted me to put her arms round his neck. So I put them round his neck, and she laid her head down on his shoulder, quite content and satisfied. And so she presently said, "'Joe!' again. And once, "'Pardon!' and once, Pip. And so she never lifted her head up any more, and it was just an hour later when we laid it down on her own bed, because we found she was gone." Biddy cried. The darkening garden and the lane and the stars that were coming out were blurred in my own sight. "'Nothing was ever discovered, Biddy. Nothing. Do you know what has become of Orlick? I should think, from the colour of his clothes, that he is working in the quarries. Of course you have seen him, then. Why are you looking at that dark tree in the lane? I saw him there, on the night she died. That was not the last time, either, Biddy. No. I have seen him there, since we have been walking here. It is of no use," said Biddy, laying her hand upon my arm as I was for running out. You know. I would not deceive you. He was not there a minute, and he's gone." It revived my utmost indignation to find that she was still pursued by this fellow, and I felt inveterate against him. I told her so, and told her that I would spend any money, or take any pains, to drive him out of that country. By degrees she led me into more temperate talk, and she told me how Joe loved me, and how Joe never complained of anything. She didn't say, of me. She had no need. I knew what she meant. But ever did his duty in his way of life, with a strong hand, a quiet tongue, and a gentle heart. Indeed, it would be hard to say too much for him," said I. And, Biddy, we must often speak of these things, for, of course, I shall be often down here now. I'm not going to leave poor Joe alone. Biddy said never a single word. 
Biddy, don't you hear me? Yes, Mr. Pip. Not to mention your calling me Mr. Pip, which appears to me to be in bad taste, Biddy. What do you mean? What do I mean? asked Biddy timidly. Biddy, said I, in a virtuously self-asserting manner, I must request to know what you mean by this. By this? said Biddy. Now don't echo, I retorted. You used not to echo, Biddy. Used not? said Biddy. Oh, Mr. Pip, used. Well, I rather thought I would give up that point, too. After another silent turn in the garden, I fell back on the main position. Biddy, said I, I made a remark respecting my coming down here often to see Joe, which you received with a marked silence. Have the goodness, Biddy, to tell me why. Are you quite sure, then, that you will come to see him often? asked Biddy, stopping in the narrow garden walk, and looking at me under the stars with a clear and honest eye. Oh, dear me, said I, as if I found myself compelled to give up Biddy in despair. This is really a very bad side of human nature. Don't say any more, if you please, Biddy. This shocks me very much. For which cogent reason I kept Biddy at a distance during supper, and, when I went up to my own old little room, took as stately a leave of her as I could, in my murmuring soul deem reconcilable, with the churchyard and the event of the day. As often as I was restless in the night, and that was every quarter of an hour, I reflected what an unkindness, what an injury, what an injustice, Biddy had done me. Early in the morning I was to go. Early in the morning I was out, and looking in, unseen, at one of the wooden windows of the forge, there I stood, for minutes, looking at Joe, already at work, with a glow of health and strength upon his face, that made it show as if the bright sun of the life in store for him was shining on it. "'Good-bye, dear Joe. No, don't wipe it off. For God's sake, give me your blackened hand. I shall be down soon and often.' "'Never too soon, sir,' said Joe, "'and never too often, Pip.' Biddy was waiting for me at the kitchen door, with a mug of new milk and a crust of bread. "'Biddy,' said I, when I gave her my hand at parting, "'I am not angry, but I am hurt.' "'No, don't be hurt,' she pleaded quite pathetically. "'Let only me be hurt, if I have been ungenerous.' Once more the mists were rising as I walked away. If they disclosed to me, as I suspect they did, that I should not come back, and that Biddy was quite right, all I can say is, they were quite right too. End of chapter 35